the Radical Secular Podcast, a demand for justice, equality, and rational public policy. Subscribe at YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and all the major podcast channels. Visit our website at theradicalsecular.com for articles, transcripts, and our complete library of episodes. Support us on Patreon and follow us on social media. Welcome to the Radical Secular Podcast. I'm Sean Prophet. And I'm Christoph Defoe. Our main topic for the day is going to be discussing Charles Murray's book that was just published a couple of weeks ago called Facing Reality, Two Truths About Race in America. Now, we've talked about Charles Murray before. Suffice to say that he is likely the leading credentialed academic proponent of pseudoscientific racism in the United States, if not the world. So, And he's not shutting up. He's doubling, tripling, and quadrupling down. In 2020, he published another book in a similar vein called Human Diversity, The Biology of Race, Gender, and Class, which is an argument for essentialism and biological determinism, which is pretty much everything he writes. Mm -hmm. His latest work will doubtless provide more fuel to feed the raging fire of white backlash against racial progress in America. So we'll get into what you need to understand about this new book and defend yourself against the self-serving right-wing talking points the book has spawned a bit later in the show. But first, today marks our 52nd episode of the Radical Secular Podcast. We made it. We're slightly past the one-year anniversary of our first episode, which aired on June 20th, 2020. Uh, That was because I think there was a two-week gap between our second and third episodes, if I remember correctly. I don't Mm. know why that happened. (laughs) I think, (laughs) Christoph, you and I were probably scratching our heads to see if we really wanted to commit ourselves to this whole new journey that we were embarking on. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But other than that, we've never missed a show, even through vacations and road trips and technical issues we've had. We're all super passionate about this project, and we hope that comes through in our content. So we're going to start our show today with a housekeeping update about where we are and more importantly, where we're going. First of all, though, I want to take the opportunity to offer my sincere thanks to you, our family of viewers and listeners who've come along uh, with us on this journey for the past year. We've learned a ton about ourselves and about Mm. podcasting and about some of the deeper and more important issues we face as a nation and a world, because a lot of times we're doing research, we come up, we find stuff that we didn't know, which is, so it's a, it's a great learning tool, uh, I think for, for all of us. So we hope that that has come through, that you've learned something. And if you're just joining us today for the first time, welcome to the Radical Secular family. We're so glad to be here with you. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just, um, you know, it's, I'm not surprised that we made it to 52 weeks um, or 52 episodes, but I'm really <laughs> glad that we did. We've come a long way. <clears throat> I've looked back at some of those old uh, old episodes early on, and um, although our, I think the stuff that we talk about is we've been remarkably consistent, I think, about how we talk about this stuff. We've gotten better at it, but I think the themes that we talk about have been pretty consistent about hierarchy, uh, about unearned hierarchy and challenging those things. Um, but I do think that we've come a long way in terms of our our like setup. I think our the, our relationship uh, has come a long way. You and me, Sean. Definitely. Um, I, you know, I think we've 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 grown closer. We've learned a lot about each other. Um, I think that for my perspective, um, you know, I I grew up knowing who you were, right? So, mm-hmm. um, but but over the last year, I've gotten to really know who you are, right? And 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 the kind of person you are, and your commitment to these issues. And I think that's that's really really important. And I. I think one of the more uh, subtle things that's happened is the honing and fine pointing of my own fine point, honing to a fine point, my views and my ideas about the world and, um, and even come off of some things that I used to, the ways I used to think about things, right? And so I think that the interactions that we have, um, especially including Joe, we're going to talk a little bit about Joe, um, uh, but the three of us, I've learned a lot about mm-hmm. about these issues and um, and especially uh, you and Joe have a lot of really like like uh, uh, real background knowledge on these issues and so between that and our guests I've re- things have come a long way man I'm really I'm just happy that we're here now 
Totally. And it's like, it, it really has been like, you know, it's almost like you're taking a college course because you're researching new stuff every mm-hmm. week for, for the show. And uh, like you said, we learn about each other. I feel like you and I are like war buddies now. We like, we're, yeah. we, have, we have been in the <laughs> trenches, man. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. And, and Joe's great. Uh, I've, I'm, you know, it's a bummer. He couldn't be here with us today. He had important family business, but we love having a college professor on the team because he's also just as passionate as we are. And he gets into it, man. He gets into detail mm-hmm. with this stuff. So, um, that is just, it's, it's a win-win I think for all of us. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And to our viewers and listeners, you probably noticed that we have a new opening segment and we're going to make the opening promo format consistent between audio and video. So we're not doing separate versions. Uh, <laughs> it's still separate versions cause I edit the audio, but the, the opening will be the same and all that contact information you need is right up front. And about all that's left to say is that new episodes post every Monday at noon Eastern time. And if you're subscribed, you already know that. If you haven't subscribed, please do it. Just do it. Do it. <laughs> Smash yeah, also, that subscribe button. Come for on. For sure. It's like, <clears throat> and that's this is the thing uh, about about subscriptions is that you you might forget. You know, you might you might forget that we and you will get notified if you subscribe either either to an audio podcast or video and. You don't want to miss these episodes. If we, we work hard on them and you don't want to miss it. So please subscribe. For sure, exactly. And look, I mean, even if uh, you can't watch that episode that week or you can't listen that week for whatever reason, right? Life comes up, you have other things going on. You maybe you listen to other podcasts. I don't know. Um, you shouldn't listen to any other podcasts, but ours, of course, that goes without <laughs> saying. Um, but, but in all seriousness, like, you know, but if you support what we do, Right. You support what we do. Like that is how we grow is through subscriptions. Right. We don't grow unless you do that. And so um, and and each time think of each time someone subscribes is we get a shot in the arm, more we energy. Do. We get more energy. Anytime someone comments, anytime we we get another boost of energy that's like, all right, man, let's fucking take this to the next level, you know, and and uh, and that's important. Yeah. And if the other thing is, if you subscribe, um, just post the episode. When, whenever yeah. it comes out. And so if you don't even have time to watch it, just post it. And exactly. that'll help us grow our base. Huge, huge. That that kind of stuff is so important. And 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 it costs and it costs listeners and viewers very little, right? I mean, it's, it's just a repost, whatever, you know. Yep. Yep. And you probably also noticed that we have new theme music that uh, I actually composed it. <laughs> yeah. Great uh, job. Thank you. I mean, not, we we didn't hate the old music. I think you said, Christoph, it sounds like NPR, which that's yeah. not bad company, but no, you, not bad at all. <laughs> but, but do you think the new music, it's less NPR like? I do think that I think that it I think that it reflects a little bit more of uh, the our approach and the way we talk about things and you know, we are, we are progressives. Uh, NPR is pretty progressive, but we're also, I think a little more, uh, edgy and radical. I like to think of ourselves than an NPR, uh, sort of voice. And so I think this music, it sort of is more evocative. I think it's a little more, um, a little more interesting. And so I, I'm on board. I think it's fantastic. And, and it's great that, uh, we didn't have to, that you composed it, that we didn't have to go and like, just, and, and license some other song. Like you, you, yeah, you no more copyright claims on YouTube. Exactly. Right? I mean, we, we exactly. actually, we, we paid for our music, but they have this really arcane registration process. You have to go through every episode. You've got to register that it was, so it's just like, fuck it, you know, right. Exactly. We'll do our own. And, and it's a learning process for me because that's not what I do. I mean, I've done some recording in my life in the past, but I'm not really a, a musician. And so I'm just kind of learning all this and how sure. to put it together and got some help from my son who's got his BFA in, in music. And so it was just, it's again, this is great. I, I love to learn new things and this project gives me plenty of opportunity. Oh my God. It's, 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 I mean, especially over those first six months, man, it was just like every week was like, holy shit. We didn't think of that. Oh my God. Now what we do. Oh my God. Now I got to buy that. And then it's just, just, you know, we started out like, you know, it's just funny how it builds. Um, And and I mean, I say that in, like you said, war buddies, right? This is all sort of like, holy shit, look how far we've come and what we went through. And um, it's, it's, it's a joy. I know. And when you go back to that first chat that we had, which was just, you know, we're just talking, it was just like a phone call. Mm-hmm. And, and we ended up posting it as an episode called race hierarchy and rule of law. And I, I just listened to the first 20 minutes of that, and it pretty much ca- encapsulated what we're trying to do and it holds up. And so I think mm-hmm. we've stayed true to our mission. And, you know, of course, what we didn't know was everything else that was going to go along with making and producing a brand. It's not just the <laughs> podcast recording, it's designing 
an online presence, you know, YouTube, the podcast channels, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, building what we hope is a credible political organization that we can use to make a difference. And obviously I, and I've been in the TV business, so I know what goes into making a weekly show, but I kind of figured for some reason that a podcast would be simpler. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, I think we, we, we take a lot of time to write and research, write and produce the episodes. And of course we love doing that, but we've been focusing on the content and, and really comparatively less on our promotion. And I mm -hmm. think, I think you've given it more thought than I have, Christoph. And it's not like if you build it, they will come. It's a very saturated mm -hmm. market. There's a lot of talkers. Uh, you can listen to celebrities. You can listen to Hillary Clinton or Don Lemon or Chris Cuomo or Pod Save America or, you know, uh, and we admire all those guys. Mm -hmm. But that means that when you're watching us, we take it as a special privilege because we know that there are all these famous people that you could be listening to instead. And we think that we're worth doing that. We'd love to hear ourselves talk. You have to, <laughs> to have enough fucking hubris to launch a podcast. But oh, uh, the egos, the egos. I know. <laughs> <clears throat> So anyway, I mean, this is our thrust for the second year. I don't want to bore you with too many details, but I want to give you a chance, Christoph, to sort of tell our listeners and viewers what we're working on. Absolutely. And, and that I think I think our first year definitely was a certainly the first eight or nine months of that was a build sort of mindset. Right. We need to build a library of content. We need to get good at this. We need to start. We need to build a website. We need to be right. Um, <clears throat> And all that kind of stuff is relatively straightforward. It's sort of like there's a set list of things to do. I could literally Google that and get <laughs> a list of things to do to build a podcast, right? Um, promotion is and growth is no is so much different. Like there's just no cut and dry playbook out there. There are vague sort of strategies for sure. Um, like there are people out there that will tell you that if you just do X, you will get Y, but it is, it, I don't think it's that simple. So, and, and the, I think one of the other bigger challenges that we fit, that we face on that front is, is that we all have lives, right? We have jobs, mm -hmm. we have wives and girlfriends um, and, and partners, we have other things that we like to do. And so it's, it, it can be really challenging. So, um, but there are a handful of strategy strategies that I have been, that we have just in some, to some extent already put into practice, but that we need, that we will, and other things that we will do in the upcoming year. Um, we have hosted guests. We'll continue to host guests. That is one of the biggest things they say to do. Um, getting booked as guests is something that is a far more challenging thing, but that is something that we are working on as well. In fact, we'll be uh, Sean and I uh, will be uh, will be appearing on a podcast in within the next month or so. And uh, and then the other thing is developing a community via Patreon, and we're going to talk a little bit about that <clears throat> mm -hmm. in a few minutes. Uh, another avenue that we've been exploring is acquiring sponsors. So um, I, a friend of mine um, has already signed on to say that she runs a small business. And so if we can get sort of small business sponsors, I think that helps build our credibility. And yeah. I think it gives us a bit of opportunity to, um, to even advertise in those environments, right? So we can give them stickers to, to have in their, in their, in their, in their businesses, right? We can, mm -hmm. um, and just to give away, right? Um, and that, and that is merchandising is also going to be part of that, right? That is also like really high on the priority list for the upcoming year. T-shirts, stickers, flags, mm -hmm. cups, whatever. I want a flag. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like this sort of stuff, so that we can, and that is going to be working tandem with the Patreon. And you know, I've heard a lot of people say that are like YouTubers and uh, and uh, etc. Say that they'd much rather talk to a, a handful of really dedicated Patreon supporters than thousands of other people that don't really give a shit about what you're saying. And I think there's right. something to that. People that actually care about. And so we're just, so the so the goal. I think I think the biggest goal we have. Sean, uh, challenge that we have, goal that we have is forming a like a like a like a, a real community that we interact with regularly, and I think the Patreon is going to be a big, big part of that. Big part, and mm -hmm. so yes, this is the final housekeeping topic we have here. Is you might have seen it in our opening that we have now launched the Patreon page, and it's hard to ask people to pay for something we're already giving away. <laughs> but I know that a lot of our listeners have contacted us wanting to contribute. So we went ahead and created that, that page. It's patreon.com slash the radical secular. So it's super easy to find. And we're planning to launch some exclusive content or 
scheduling a live chat for our listeners or you know doing those kind of community building things. We might include some of our behind the scenes chats before and after the shows. We haven't fully finalized what we're going to be offering in terms of those sorts of subscriber only premiums, but we we do have some physical premiums, t-shirts and stickers and so forth. And there's even a mug and a poster you get if you support us for a whole year. So mm -hmm. any little bit you want to contribute to our effort would definitely help with our hosting costs. Your contributions will help us get the word out through advertising and promotional projects that, that Christoph just talked about. We have our support tiers are $3 a month, $9 a month, and $27 a month. And we know that like anybody can afford three bucks. Nine is like, you're, you're awesome. You're, you're a, uh, a solid supporter and 27 is just like over the moon. So um, <laughs> we know that we, again, you could, you could Sean subscribe. and I will show up at your house and we <laughs> will, we, we will show up at your house and we will do motorcycle tricks for you. I guess we're into motorcycles. <laughs> I don't know. I just yeah. made that up, but I, I'm just coming up with stuff now. <laughs> but really we do, we do want to engage with you and drop us Absolutely. some line about things you'd like to hear us talk about. And, you know, that's the other thing, Christoph, that you could mention right now, what kind of topics and content do you see us covering in our second year? to really differentiate from what we've been doing. Where do you see the project taking us ultimately? Yeah, that's that's a great point. And so one of the things um, that I think is important, I mean, first of all, I think we will stay, I know that we will, because I know this is this is important to you, Sean, and it's really important to me, is our commitment to justice and our commitment to the topics that we hammer on all the time, which is, uh, and uh, I know we we talk about this. So we're blue in the face, uh, unearned hierarchy, right? Yeah, uh, and, that's and it. The and the, that's that's the whole fucking shebang, and that is the whole shebang. That is what you when you distill all the things that we talk about all the time, it comes down to that. And um and importantly. Uh, people's defense of unearned hierarchy, right? That's yes. called conservatism. That is what yeah. conservatism is, is is defense of unearned hierarchy. Like that's what it is. And it's so, the whole shebang and they try to, the they try to deny fucking it. Shebang. <laughs> they try to deny it. They try and call it freedom. They call it all kinds of fucking things, right? They patriotism. call it uh, patriotism. Uh, patriot, that's another great one. Patriotism, the war on terror, on yeah. and on and on. But it's always the same theme. A group yeah. of people that are relatively powerful wanted to, to maintain that power and influence. Um, so uh, we, we will definitely keep talking about that and we'll talk about it in different contexts. But I think that another thing we want to do is really try to, and I and we've talked about this preliminarily, and that is sort of branch out into um, other sort of shows, right? So mm -hmm. if we can attack these issues from a different perspective. And um, so we've talked to Drew Scott about this. We've talked to, um, and uh, and that that is on the table. We talked to, um, I mean, I uh, have uh, uh, like, uh, there, there's a there, anything's on the table. Anything's on the table from that perspective. And in fact, if you have an idea and you want, we want to join, turn this into basically a network, right? We want to mm -hmm. network a system Ultimately, that's the long term goal, like a system, a, a network of, of of shows and ideas and writers like that is the goal. So if that's something you're on, you're on board with, you want to write, you want to you want to do a show, you have an idea like let's talk about that. For sure. Well, that's that's definitely engaging with our community is what we are here to do. So absolutely. All right. Well, let's get into. For, oh, we got to do T-shirts. Yeah. What you wearing today? <laughs> so today I'm wearing my KTM t-shirt. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, KTM's, <laughs> I joke about this a lot, but KTM's um, uh, sort of tagline is ready to race, um, which is cheesy, but it, it, it's KTM is a motorcycle brand and it's the kind of motorcycle that I ride. And I just got back from um, a ride uh, a over Juneteenth weekend. I went with my my friend Luke and we went on a adventure motorcycle ride, which is off road on road. Uh, it was just a ton of fun. And it was the first time that I really got to put I went on a on a uh, on a. Uh, adventure motorcycle in course a couple months ago and it was the first mm -hmm. time that i really got to put that stuff to the test and the difference was night and day since the last time i was on those trails so um i figure i'm, I'm feeling very motorcycly right now and by the way i'm gonna do a shameless plug here if you're into uh, motorcycle videos check out my uh check out my instagram and check out my uh my facebook page because i like to post short short videos um, i'm not a yeah. great video editor but uh look i'm learning and i and that's part of the process too it's fun I love your videos and I'm super fucking jealous of your trail riding. So that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to get out there. We'll have to get out there together at some point, man. I know. All right. Well, my shirt is topical. It says mm -hmm. good night, white pride. Nice. That is and right it's, on. Right it's got on. like a guy kicks box, kickboxing another guy. And look, here's the point. I, I, 
I am white. I have nothing against white people. Okay. What I don't like is white people patting themselves on the back for being white. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, there's, there's no need to be fucking proud of your race. Okay. Whatever the fuck it is. It's just, you know, and, and the, the, the problem in our country right now is that one group of people who's been oppressed is asking, don't oppress us. And the other group who's been in charge <laughs> is saying, what about us? You know, mm -hmm. so it's th this th white pride is fucking bullshit. And, you know, no white person ever has to feel threatened by the idea of equality. OK, it's just it's it's just not in the cards. I and I've talked to people about it and they're like, you know, I've heard this kind of complaining. It's like, oh, my God, the media is always attacking white people. White people are the only group that it's still OK to make fun of. And it's like, no, no. <laughs> This is not directed at you. Okay. It's directed at, at people who are fucking racist. All right. And if you're exactly. not racist, you don't have anything to worry about. That's exactly right. You know, if you're not, if you're not going around, um, you know, making racist jokes, if you're not going around, uh, you know, trying to pretend that, you know, somebody who got shot had was, was somehow guilty and deserved it. Right. Then you got nothing to worry about. But That's unfortunately exactly right. there is too much of that going on there. There is, too, you know, and this white pride thing, it's like straight pride. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, you don't need straight pride, you know, men's you're not, nobody's pride, <laughs> men's pride, right? What? We're in fucking charge. Like white <laughs> men are in charge. We don't need, we don't need to sit there and, and, and toot our own horn. Okay. Everybody already knows. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I think that it's really important. And first of all, it, it, this is like all lives matter or blue lives matter. It is inherently reactionary. Right. It is. And that it, it, it is not it, like if if there wasn't a black uh, like a pride, uh, a black pride or or, or uh, LGBTQ uh, pride, then there wouldn't even be a straight pride. Right. If there wasn't a feminist movement, then there wouldn't be a men's a, a, right. a men's thing. It's, it's, it's necessarily reactionary. And um, and it's in bad faith. Right. Because um, and and it just in at 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 best, at very best, it's being very charitable. It reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of power, right? It reflects a, a fundamental misunderstanding of of uh, of privilege, and um, and again, that is the most charitable way I can put that without saying those people are just fucking like bad faith racists. But like maybe they're not. Maybe I think most people aren't. I think most well, people are just ignorant. It's also just it's just fucking whiny snowflake shit, right? For sure. I mean, it's like oh, what about me? And it's like some guy is laying there with a broken leg and you look, you're like, what about my leg? You exactly. Know? That's, yes. that's what it is. That's exactly right. <laughs> All right. Well, this, <laughs> this, this whole thing is the topic that we're going to talk about today. And it's mm -hmm. why I wore the shirt because this book by Charles Murray is just one big, uh, white people wine. <laughs> okay. Mm. It's just, and, and the, so this is our main topic. It's, it's a much bigger topic than we can properly cover in a single episode. And it's totally infuriating. So the book is Facing Reality, Two Truths About Race in America. We've touched on this before in episode 21, Race, Genetics, and IQ, as well as our discussion about the controversy over Senator Tim Scott in episode 47. Mm -hmm. But this game is stepping up. Race pseudoscience is becoming a bigger and bigger part of GOP strategy due to the right wing media firestorm of 2021 over critical race theory. OK, <laughs> and the fight over whether or not America is or is not a racist country. So it's extremely important that people on the left and across the spectrum are aware of the nuances of this issue because the stakes couldn't be higher. The battle over how race is perceived in America will determine whether or not we keep making progress toward justice and equality or whether the political winds shift back as they seem to be doing in many places toward another generational retrenchment into undemocratic Jim Crow policies. So as you may know, Charles Murray is a controversial American sociologist and political scientist with a BA from Harvard and a PhD from MIT. He's come under some withering criticism even from his own alma mater. His statistical research about IQ and crime is probably sound. I don't think, Christoph, either you or I have the academic mm -hmm. background to weigh in on that, but his conclusions are decidedly not sound. And he's best known for the 1994 book, The Bell Curve, which also provides a lot of the research basis for his current book. In fact, a way, the way I sort of describe the current book, it's basically a short 150 page summary of the main IQ and crime data that he covered in the bell curve. Mm. So that's not new. He's updated the book with recent statistics and he has also added a lot of current white nationalist talking points. 
So I want to be clear, though, this book's not a polemic. It's lucid, methodical, very academic in its presentation. And, you know, Charles Murray's obviously thought deeply about what he's written, and I think he sincerely believes what he's saying. And he just also happens to believe a lot of vile things about how our society should be organized that don't necessarily follow from his data. And yet he believes that he's been led to these conclusions by the data he's compiled. So it's, you know, he's he's horribly misguided. And I think he's in the unique position of both being used as a pawn by America's right wing, but also having his career and standing advanced and having gotten a lot of funding because he tells a lot of right wingers exactly what they want to hear on race, yeah. which is that race is a scientifically meaningful construct and that race is determinative of a person's value to society and the position they should hold in that society. So mm -hmm. he's Mr. Hierarchy, I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. He's not a Tucker Carlson or a Charlie Kirk or Ben Shapiro, Sean Hannity, Dan Bongino. He's not a propagandist or a demagogue, but he's got a real uh, symbiotic relationship with those guys. He provides a lot of credibility to their racist talking points. And it's he just provides fodder to feed their fire. And it's, you know, he dresses it up in academic clothing. And I personally think it makes him even more dangerous. Mm -hmm. He also uh, adopts this whole white victimhood right-wing troll kind of tactic of claiming ideological persecution and censorship because he goes against the academic consensus, you know, deplatforming and all that crap. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's been deplatformed and he's been, you know, he's, but look, it's because he's wrong in his conclusions and it, he's not, you know, he's, if he was presenting something that was academically supportable, in terms of his conclusions, he wouldn't be being deplatformed. Yeah. But the, the, the role of a university, I think, is to curate what is real knowledge and what is demagoguery. And I don't think there's any particular reason why students need to be exposed to demagoguery like this. But the, the, see, it's if there's grains of truth, and this is the issue. Mm. Unlike so <laughs> many in the right wing fever swamp, Murray has academic chops and Kind of surprisingly, in the book, he acknowledges many of the complaints liberals have been making for years about race in America. And then, of course, he proceeds to eviscerate the liberal drive toward racial equality as futile. So he's in the unique position on the right of being someone who ostensibly respects hard data, which is super rare. But at the same time, he claims that his data supports a horrible, extremely racist agenda. So if you believe his statistics, he really does provide the left with a significant substantive intellectual challenge to some of our policy solutions we've long taken as sacrosanct, such as affirmative action. Now, since neither you nor I, Christoph, have an academic background to really drill down into the data, I want to take a different approach, which is that we're going to assume for today's discussion that his data on IQ and crime are accurate, because I don't think we need to overturn those claims to go after Murray's conclusions. Mm -hmm. Let's take him at face value, because I think we can argue successfully that even if every data point he presents is true that he still reaches wildly wrong conclusions that fly in the face of long established social science. So that's the challenge we're up against. The data he cites, if we accept his presentation from the angle he cites it, does seem to pose a challenge to liberal orthodoxy on things like equal employment opportunity and affirmative action. And that's damned uncomfortable to think about. So I don't know, what's your take on that? Is there anything valid from your perspective about his work on uh, IQ and crime? Well, I think my the first thing that comes to my mind is what we talked about in terms of like a post liberal, post liberalism and and as a policy sort of uh, perspective, and that is being willing to. And part of that, I think, is being willing to hunt, like get into the attack the sacred cows of liberalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, and 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 not nest not just for the sake of destroying them, obviously, but for the sake of challenging them, right? And uh, because if we are not willing to concede that um, African Americans on average have lower IQs, right, then the like if that's what the data says, and I think that is what the data says, then we talk about that in, the, in our episode race and IQ. Right? Yeah. That was that was the theme of the whole fucking thing. But the whole but like and so we can concede that even though it makes us uncomfortable, it makes liberals uncomfortable for sure. It makes me uncomfortable to sort of concede that out loud. But mm -hmm. 
still, we have to do that if we are people who think who think of ourselves as data driven, who care about science, who care about getting it right. We care about climate change, right? We don't get to switch it off when it makes us uncomfortable. We just don't get to do that. We have to be um, ethically consistent. Now, that doesn't mean that the conclusions that we draw based on that, right? Um, right. That 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 we conclude what what Murray concludes, and because all that's ultimately besides the point, right? Because the reasons why black people are on uh, average uh, have lower IQs is because of white fucking supremacy. It's because of four hundred years of slavery. It's because of Jim Crow. It's because of all these things. But right? we know how. Smart people who marry smart people and have babies with smart people get smart kids, right? Mm -hmm. If you have been deprived, if you grew up in an environment where your brain didn't develop correctly, and then you have a child with somebody who also had that exact same experience and yep. then grows up in, in poverty, this is what we call intergenerational poverty, right? Yep. This is what happens. So, so again, yes, we need to we need to concede this stuff, but then we need to follow that up right away with like, yeah, but then how do we make sure it doesn't happen in the future? Because this is not inevitable. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. It's intellectual honesty, right? And mm -hmm. I think that we never win by being intellectually dishonest, even if something's mm -hmm. inconvenient, because what that does is that makes us take the, another trip around and go, oh, well, the IQs are lower. Why are they lower? Let's fix that. Let's do something about it. Right. right. And I want to start with, because people work backwards from the preferred conclusion. And, and that's, <laughs> I, I, I want to make a couple of observations about what drives people to embrace race pseudoscience to begin with. And these are going to be familiar concepts to our longtime listeners. But if you're just now joining us, we submit that the basic through line for right-wing policy is the conservative moral hierarchy as outlined mm. by George Lakoff in his 1996 book, Moral Politics, How Liberal and, and Conservatives Think. It's also discussed in Corey Robbins' foundational 2011 book, The Reactionary Mind, and also in the seminal 2019 video produced by Ian Danskin called The Alt-Right Playbook, Always a Bigger Fish. Everybody anyway, should read and watch all of that stuff because it is just so, like you said, foundational. Changes your thinking. I mean, once you start mm -hmm. understanding that these right-wing policy positions are all that, that is their one common thread is exactly. is the hierarchy thing and that's and Always. that's what drives race pseudoscience as well because they're like oh they're stupider and they commit more crimes let's relegate them to a lower position in society it's like that's exactly. what they want to do anyway that's what they want to do anyway it's, it's just a way of justifying that <laughs> that's all it is <laughs> yeah. yeah so i mean Char what charles murray's doing in his books is using his sort of right libertarian beliefs and his copious data sets to derive a really terrible ought from a really terrible is. Mm. And that's the basic statement of the is ought problem, which is perennial subject in moral philosophy. Plenty of people will tell you that you can't derive an ought from an is one microsecond before they do it themselves. And <laughs> it really flows from a deep well of hypocrisy because everybody has their biases about the kind of world they would like to inhabit, the best of all possible worlds cliche. And we bring those biases to every ethical discussion Perhaps you are somebody who likes the idea of a hierarchical society, but if you're going to, you know, at least be honest about what you're doing. We're no <laughs> exception. We have our preferences. We on the radical secular believe that the highest goal is justice, which should lead to a society with high levels of both dignity and equality and human flourishing for people at all levels of aptitude, which can be best achieved through rational public policy. We believe that the power of the state can and should be used to do good, to reward intelligent, civilized behavior and to punish thieves, barbarians, and bad actors. Uh, we believe that the long-term progress toward these goals is not only possible, but it's a moral fucking imperative. It, it, it really fucking is. And um, and even from the most practical standpoint, and I think about this in turn a lot when I uh, think about libertarians, I say think about libertarians because I don't talk to them because um, why, why? Um, so, but, the, here's the thing. It's like if you are a libertarian, if you are a conservative and you really just think that people should just be able to just die or should just not or should starve if they if they if they can't sort of hack it in your uh, social Darwinist uh, sort of environment. So but it's like, you know, you can only build so many walls because like the the, the end result here is uh, is wealthy, powerful people in gated sort of castles, essentially, and mm -hmm. just people dead in the street starving like that is the outcome and so it's like i always like I'm like I'm, and 
I say to myself or to these people in my head, I'm like, is that really what you want? Because I think a lot of people haven't thought it through to think that that's where this ends, right? But yeah. um, feudalism is where this ends, right? Um, but I, but then there's, but the people that are powerful in this situation, this is exactly what they're gunning for. And we're going to talk about that. Yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> Charles Murray takes the tragic view of human nature and society. And exactly. You know, it's always being worried about the unintended consequences. What's going to happen if you try to make it better? It's going to be worse. And it's like, Ugh. what about the intended consequences? <laughs> you know, <laughs> there, and there's a quote right near the end of the book that really jumped right off the page at me because I've heard the same kind of self justifications from conservatives my entire life. Basically, that the liberal project is doomed. We can't mm -hmm. make the world better, so we shouldn't try. Uh, lest we fall under the spell of the dreaded communism or socialism, the utopias, and the world either devolves toward tyranny or explodes into chaos. So that is always like the hell the world is going to hell in a handbasket is, is essentially what they're what they're always saying. And so I want to read you this quote from the book. He says, treating our fellow human beings as individuals instead of treating them as members of groups is unnatural. Our brains evolve to think of people as members of groups to trust and care for people who are like us and to be suspicious of people who are not. So you can see him setting up this subtle racism justification, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the combination of acquisitiveness and loyalty to the interests of one's own group, be it defined by ethnicity or class, shaped human governments for the subsequent 10,000 years. The natural form of government was hierarchical, run by a dominant group that arranged affairs to its benefit and oppressed outsiders to a lesser or greater degree, usually greater. The rare attempts to try any other form of government were unstable and short-lived, end quote. So... What he says after this is he's talking about how America is this unique thing and and because all of these other governments were tyrannical and and dictatorial. Mm -hmm. But we talk so, about that all the time too. We talk about yeah. it all the time, right? Like this is a miracle of yeah. a, a miracle what the world we're living in, right? The country we're living in right now in that sense. But effectively what he's saying is that you know, it's so difficult to 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 push back against this kind of of hierarchical tyranny that what America did is so fragile. We have to be so careful with it. Um because if we don't get it right, then it's going to turn in back into total chaos. So mm -hmm. this is his basic orientation. And aside from this whole thing being this naked argument from tradition, like we can't possibly do better, uh, <laughs> there's two problems with this passage. And it's it's because it's the naturalistic fallacy, right? Basically, that what's natural is also good. Mm -hmm. And I mean, murder is natural. Arsenic is natural. S supernovas are natural. You know, mm -hmm. we try to avoid those things and to the extent <laughs> we can. And uh, so the second is his sort of tragic flaw, fatalism, that we should accept any necessary injustice out of a kind of innate moral deference to hierarchy as an end in itself. That going against power as an organizing principle is merely a different kind of injustice. We've like kind of flipped it around that hurts different people, namely those at the top of the self-organizing hierarchy. So that's social Darwinism in a nutshell, right? Just mm -hmm. let, let it happen however it's going to happen. Survival of the fittest war of all against all, might makes right, basically ruthless competition without regard for justice. So along with this tragic view of human nature comes the idea that more equal societies make people soft by rewarding a lack of personal achievement. And this is a barbaric attitude, like people have to suffer, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a declaration of failure and it's everything we stand against. So uh, now Charles Murray uses this tragic view to argue that because America as a nation proposes in its founding documents to treat its citizens equally, it's incredibly uniquely fragile, as I was mentioning, and that we can't make our nation too equal or it will destroy itself for violating some kind of political law of nature or something. And we'll come back to that idea at the end of the show. But how does that whole thing strike you? Strikes me as fucking fascist is what it does. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, straight up. I mean, this is, this is, I, I remember talking to somebody on, uh, or just reading a thread on, on uh, Facebook at some point. Um, I think it's one of those, one of those, um, one of those groups that I'm a part of, and they'll like post stuff that a right winger uh, said that is so outrageous. And so that, that everyone is super liberal in the group and they all laugh and da, da, da. But I went and I went to the, the right wingers page and this guy's a straight up monarchist, like yeah. monarchist, right? Like this is, which is essentially a fascist, right? I mean, it's, I mean, that's, that's what modern version kind of, of authoritarianism, Look, right? Um, authoritarianism always ends up devolving to dictatorship and exactly. dictatorship always ends up devolving to one guy. Exactly. I mean, so that's it's what monarchy. always happens. So it's monarchy, <laughs> essentially. I'm like, this is really the argument you're making. And, you know, in terms of Murray himself, 
you know, I, I'm just, it's really insidious. And you said this at the top because he is really insidious because he makes statements that are true about the world, right? Like that we, that like you and I, people who care about science and data and real life. And we're like, yeah, well, that is a true statement. But then he makes these outrageous conclusions as a result of that. So it's so insidious because on the front, like, it's like, there's this meme that's always like, yeah, they had us in the first half. I'm not going to lie. Right. Like that's Mm -hmm. like the the meme setup. And it's like, oh, wait, he had me in the first half. But then at the same time, like, wait a second though. So you're saying that we should just let people die or there's just a permanent underclass, like, or we should just not do anything. That's madness. So, um, yeah, but again, well, what's insidious <laughs> about it is that it, he leaves this hook for people that want this to happen to hang their hat on and a, a, like a, a intellectual hook. And that's what's so dangerous about it. Well, look, I mean, it, it, it can tend to come off as well poisoning, but in this case, it's actually true. And that is that, you know, <laughs> Charles Murray works for the American Enterprise Institute. And so mm-hmm, what, mm-hmm. Do you, what do you expect? Exactly. <laughs> They're an exactly. unapologetic think tank. They promote laissez-faire capitalism, slashing taxes on the wealthy, and as we've said many times, reimagining America as a feudal state. So this was the subject of Nancy McLean's book, Democracy in Chains, and much of what she predicted has already taken place. I mean, it's done. Uh, And it's been given academic cover by scholars such as Charles Murray, such as James Buchanan, uh, Milton Friedman, and other right libertarians who attack the liberal consensus and promote trickle-down economics. And Mm trickle-down economics has always been a stalking horse for racism. Oh, of course. You know, it's like, uh, it's really a conflict of interest, actually, for a scholar to pretend to be impartial about how society should be organized when he's also part of an organization that wants lower wages for workers, in fact, wants to abolish the minimum wage altogether, while at the same time accepting generous corporate subsidies and event demanding lower taxes for the wealthy. It's Does anyone doubt for a minute that if corporations could get away with it, that they would just pay their workers nothing? <laughs> you know, it's like to a lot of right wingers, there was not anything wrong with plantation capitalism. It made mm-hmm. a lot of slave owners fabulously wealthy. So There are many places in the world today that manufacture a lot of the products that we buy, which still operate sweatshops that keep people in a similar similar kind of servitude based on their own poverty and desperation. There's dozens of countries in the world where people earn under one US dollar per hour, if you can imagine. And in order to keep the steady flow of workers going, capitalism worldwide relies on people's fear of starvation, because let's be clear, nobody would work for a dollar an hour if they had any Mm -hmm. choice. Wage slavery is absolutely still slavery. I mean, slaves in the American South were fed and housed. 100%. That was, that was, I'm glad that you said that because that was the next word out of my mouth was wage slave. I think this is a word that you, that you and I need to normalize, man, because this is it. When you think about it that way, when you say like, I mean, it is, it's violence in some sense, right? Because you're like, no, unless you do what this, this owner class tells you to do, you will die. You will starve. Mm-hmm. There is no safety, right? And, and you right libertarians, if we're up to them, there would be no safety net at all, right? Um, right? And you would have to live off of charity or off the good graces of your master, right? In the law, this is interesting. You'll find this interesting, I think. In the law, when you go back to like reading old property uh, property texts or old cases, you know, the, the name for an employer was master, and right. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about actual slaves, right? I'm talking about there was master and servant. That was how we talked about employers and employees. So that is the legacy. That is the um, the the uh, the uh, what's not legacy. The um, the genealogy, perhaps, of the modern corporate state. Right? It has evolved. It has become something that we uh, we value some workers more than we value other workers. But that is that is the heritage, man. That is the heritage, and that's what we're dealing with. And uh, capitalism. You know, I think about this sometimes, Sean, when I, uh, you know, the other day I was on the motorcycle trip a couple, this is last month, a couple months ago. And, you know, I realized that I was one short, one shirt short. I mm-hmm. didn't have a shirt. So I had, so I ran into a, a Walmart and I bought a shirt because I was like, fuck, I don't have a shirt for tomorrow. I got to buy a shirt. So I buy a shirt, you know, whatever, like $11 shirt, the cheapest shirt yeah. I could fucking find, right? $11. Huh. $11 for a shirt. And I'm like, a, a slave made this. Yeah. That's why I have this. A, literally, right? I mean, they are being paid a dollar maybe, but I mean, right. like you said, to your point, they're essentially slaves, sometimes actually locked in the building. So, I mean, let's be, I'm not saying I, I shouldn't have bought that shirt, but let's be very clear about what's going on. Let's be clear-eyed about that. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because 
the COVID-19 pandemic exposed something mm-hmm. else. And that is that in the US and other rich countries, whenever there are regular stimulus and unemployment checks going out, it raises wages. Mm. Because when employers are desperate for workers, they suddenly become willing to pay more. And who knew? People just aren't willing to work for starvation wages if they get even a little bit of help from the government. Who knew? And we, we've, we've seen how upset Republicans are about this. It's like, oh, nobody wants to work. It's like, yeah, because you're not paying them. And mm-hmm. now they, they're, they're not starving because they got an unemployment check, right? So it, it completely explains why libertarians are against any safety net for the poor. They don't want any competition from the taxpayer for workers. They want people to have to work or starve so they'll work for less. And this also explains why wealthy donors have completely paralyzed the Republican Party. You know, they're called the party of no for a reason. Mm-hmm. They won't do anything that broadly reduces poverty or helps the American people. And politics in the U.S. since Reagan has been consumed with fighting over maybe five or 10 percentage points of corporate profits that could either go to workers or go to investors. That's the entire battle, right, between the left and the right. Um, Absolutely. Republicans want it all to go to investors. And it, it, it's not a... It's not about the money only, though, because Republicans want workers to have zero negotiating power. That's why they Mm -hmm. oppose unions, and that's why they oppose public benefits, because those things give workers leverage. Yep. And it's crystal clear that throughout the book that Charles Murray wouldn't have any problem keeping people who were below a certain IQ as a permanent underclass. He considers them both disposable and unteachable. And a lot of those people he's talking about would just happen to be black. Right. Of course they would. What a coinky dink. Oh, look who, look who, uh, ha, wonder why. Yeah, so I, mean, I see this whole thing as the crux of the issue, this airtight connection between systemic racism and laissez-faire capitalism. In terms of the impact on black people, these two systems are effectively one and the same. And that's absolutely right. And, you know, in Black Reconstruction in America, we did, uh, you know, that is that is the thrust of that entire book. You would think that it would be about race and of course it is and racism and and uh and jim crow i'm sorry reconstruction and it is a beautiful beautiful history of that but ultimately it is making the argument and by the way mlk made this exact same argument which is there is no power and freedom without economic freedom right because right. and that and that is the new that is the new mold sean for how the conservative right is is has enslaved people right so technically you can go and find another job right but um but you don't have any job security there either and Mm -hmm. they could fire you at any single time and so you were basically beholden to this organization and you jump when they say when they say jump you say you say how high right and even white collar workers that are making good livings are working 12 hour days a 12 hour day is now just kind of a given in right. many, many industries. That is just a given. I'm sure in Hollywood, it's a given. It's definitely in it's definitely in Wall Street, like definitely in law firms in New York City. I tell you that. I mean, that's why I don't work in a law firm in New York City anymore, because that is a baseline given 12 hours. And that's just when you're in the office, right? right. That is just when you are after, because even when you're on vacation, it's you're never stop working. That basically, how is that not slavery over you? How is that not slavery? It is sure you get paid more. And, it, and but like you said, uh, enslaved Africans also got food. They got a house. Yeah. Right. So the standards have changed. But ultimately, we're talking about the same thing. And we're not even talking about low wage workers. here. I'm talking about the wealthy workers, not right. even the low wage workers here. Right. So. It's always, and to, to go back to your your uh, earlier point, Sean, is that uh, you know it's markets, 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 laissez faire, laissez faire, laissez faire, until it gets to the point where it's like, oh wait a second, now the market also determines the price of labor, right? Yeah. That's also market driven, but now we don't want that to be market driven. No, 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 no. We don't want because we don't want that. We only want it to be market driven and laissez faire capitalism when it's convenient for us, the 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 owner class. Like that is when we want it to be that way, and that is deeply troubling, um, but also not at all surprising. Well, and also you have to think about when you know this whole libertarian conceit. It's like, well, you don't like it, just get another job. Well, oh. if if there's price fixing in the labor market, which there has been, exactly, right, there's price fixing. They'll, you know, every one of these shit jobs pay the same. You know, exactly. and they're usually either minimum wage or a couple bucks above minimum wage. And mm-hmm. only recently did we see suddenly fast food restaurants are argue, are, are advertising eighteen twenty dollar an hour jobs. It's like wow, and they can Go make figure. money. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. So, Go fucking figure. All right. Well, 
back to the book, we have to understand when considering the work of Charles Murray, we got to see it for what it is, which is a twisting of real world data about racial differences that we have to assume is at least somewhat valid. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. entirely fabricated into sure. a post hoc justification of the inequality represented by the capitalist status quo. He can't say that, of course, you know, he's just <laughs> only following the data. Uh, oh, of course. <laughs> As with other conservatives, the sort of feudalist wealth agenda is always couched in flowing rhetoric about the wonder and meaning of the American experiment, the last oh. best hope for humanity. And in one of the worst possible insults in the opening pages of his book, Murray uses the American creed, which is we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and Martin Luther King's statement about judging people by the content of their character to justify colorblindness and official government impartiality. This is the new right-wing gambit. And it's no coincidence that we hear this same rhetoric on the regular from Tucker Carlson. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's probably one of the biggest offenders, but they're all saying it now, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, there's a there's a quote I'm going to read here, which is from a little girl, a nine year old girl. And these talking points are now trickling down to children. So uh, I want to read this. This is from an article in Newsweek. This girl said, I said there should be no BLM in schools, period. It is a political message and getting rid of police officers, rioting, burning buildings down while King Governor Tim Waltz just sits on the <laughs> throne and watches. I do not judge people by the color of their skin. I don't really care what color their hair, skin, or eyes is. I judge by the way they treat me, she said. She added that Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream that one day my four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That dream has come true. So, so this little girl, there's <laughs> so many things wrong with this. I mean, she used, she's using these conservative language by calling a democratic governor a king. She is bastardizing Martin Luther King's statement to make it seem like racism is over and we're not, we're now just being all judged on our character. And this is, this is mainstream Republican orthodoxy at this point. Mm -hmm. How does it make you feel to hear this from a nine-year-old girl? It pisses me off in the first instance, uh, Sean, because um, we all know, you and I know that, that her parents have sort of indoctrinated her, right? But her parents would have been the people who hated Martin Luther King when he was alive, right? Mm -hmm. They would, every conservative today who hates Colin, ha Colin ha Kaepernick, who wears those shirts that say, um, I stand for the flag and kneel before God or whatever the fuck, you know, like these are the same people that would hate MLK. They would hate the movement. They would be demonizing him just like they demonized Colin Kaepernick, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I'm, I'm as in her quote, I'm th I, she says like, oh, I don't care about the color of their skin. Da, da, da. It reminds me though, you know, people say like, I don't care if he's blue, purple, or green. I don't care <laughs> exactly. what, you know, you know, that fucking line, <laughs> or purple, you know, you know? <laughs> or purple, I don't care, <laughs> but you know, they do, right. They you do. know they do. And, and what it is, what it is, Sean is purposefully overlooking systemic issues, right? So it's yeah. Does it right? And and this idea that, and I, I read a quote about about this recently, and, and I and I just will just paraphrase it. But the gist of it is like we need to get away from this idea that racism equals like, that that people need to be a bad person, like they like it's something like to be racist, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, it's not that simple. It's not like uh, you would look at a racist and be, be like ha, ha 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 ha, like some sort of evil right, like a villain in a comic book. It's like no no no. It's usually just average normal people living their lives and not realizing that they are benefiting from privilege, not realizing that there are systemic issues in place here. So to answer your question. I am, this is fucking infuriating. It's infuriating. This is why it's so important that we talk about critical race theory, although not critical race theory, because that's not what's actually going to be taught in, in high schools or anything like that. But, no. um, but we need to talk about the real history of the United States, because that's uh, kids like this are going to grow up to be conservative Republicans and they're going to end up being racist. I mean, for sure. I mean, right. Well, she's absolute. already racist and they've, already appro is. they've appropriated Martin Luther King. He's a convenient um, oh, safe so black man. Exactly. He's dead. He can't yep. speak. He's not saying yeah, anything. Yeah. He's right? dead. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and where, but the ones who are alive, who are actually speaking, um, they, they, they still hate. So it's just they still hate that you're absolutely right. And, and the, the ad appropriation, we, we talk, we talk about, uh, you know, the weird things around cultural appropriation, but like, this is just like, this is the kind of appropriation 
that is exactly wrong, right? This kind of let me take this 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 incredibly important public figure that has been that was a that was a the spearhead of a movement for justice and then use it to oppress. That is yeah. astonishing. It is basically like you know uh, the truth. It's like um, it's 1984. It's like it, it feels 1984 esque using yep. language that says you are free, freedom is slavery, slavery is like that kind of stuff, right? Well, they're taking his most famous quote of all time pretty much mm -hmm. and yep. using it to say that we can't challenge systemic racism. Exactly. So Ugh. it's horrible. Um, all right. Well, Murray starts his book by railing against so-called identity politics, which is another one of these horrible phrases. As that being, was like the that was the precursor to wokeism, the precursor like right like there, there's yeah. a new word for the same concept, but the same concept is just basically like equality, justice. That's really yeah. what they're saying they're against. It went it evolved political correctness, identity yep. politics, right. wokeism, right. critical yep. race theory. These are their exactly. racist yep. gambits evolving through over the years. And exactly. So he's saying that it's a direct repudiation of America's creed and that, quote, the core premise of identity politics is that people are inescapably defined by the groups into which they are born, which is false. That's that is not. Like, what a straw man argument. What a straw man argument. Sa Sam Harris does this, too. It is such a straw man. No, literally nobody is saying that. <laughs> nobody. And, it, it, you know, identity politics and critical race theory claim that what's happening is that people are locked into long-term and cumulative disadvantage through exactly. the oppressive function of the American system as designed by its founders, not mm -hmm. by some flaw or dysfunction. We're not trying to say the system is broken. We're trying to say mm -hmm. by design. And this it's is key. exactly how it was designed. <laughs> and it particularly refers to the Constitution's hands-off approach to regulating commerce allowing great discretion in the running of private businesses, including racial discrimination and a nearly infinite amount of income and wealth accumulation. Because mm -hmm. as we know, this gets into a, a, a problem where when you get somebody who's got $200 billion, they're approaching the power of a government in terms of what they can spend and how they can move things or to rearrange things to suit them, right? So yep. it's not just an issue of wealth, it's an issue of, of, of unchecked power, which is of course what we always rail against. Mm -hmm. and. We know that there was no income tax specified in the Constitution until the 16th Amendment was adopted in 1913. And this was partially, again, to deal with the robber barons who were accumulating all this wealth and also to help the government fund everything it does to alleviate inequality mm -hmm. comes from the payment of those taxes. Right. So yeah. the basic libertarian claim that Murray echoes is that the American system as designed is just fine and that if we want a meritocracy, we should go back to that Constitution their pre-16th Amendment hands-off approach. And right-wing libertarians, they may try to dance around this point, but their real agenda is to eliminate all taxes. That's what they mean when they say, you know, Grover Norquist, who said he wants to make government so small he can drown it in a bathtub. Well, what do you think he's talking about? Mm -hmm. The fuck, you know? Uh, yep. he, he means abolish all the taxes that fund the government and allow it to intervene in the economy. They want that 16th Amendment gone. And, mm -hmm. and if they ever got their constitutional convention, that's one of the things they would do. And so this is the fundamental objection of conservatives when it comes to teaching critical race theory, and which correctly points out that the intended function of our system of government uh, from its founding, okay, was a hands-off approach and that it produces racist outcomes. That, that is the nub of critical race theory. And yep. so, you know, actions of private business have long led to, you know, there's mortgage redlining. Uh, if this has been cumulative over many generations, wage suppression, hiring practices that discriminate against non-whites. This is what American corporations have done. And he sidesteps this issue in favor of impugning the capacity for intelligence of black Americans. And he focuses on their high levels of criminal behavior while arguing at the same time for elimination of government intervention. Mm. Here's another quote from his book. He says, liberals believe that it is appropriate for the government to play racial favorites to dispense favors and penalties according to the group to which individuals belong. My view is that this position has proved to be toxic. It is based on the premise that all groups are equal in the ways that shape economic, social, and political outcomes for groups, and that therefore all differences in group outcomes are artificial and indefensible. That premise is factually wrong, hence this book about race differences in cognitive ability and criminal behavior." End quote. 
Can you comment on that, man? <laughs> on, I mean, oh my God. I mean, it's just, it's so disgusting and so racist that it's hard to even to even talk about it. But you know what is fundamental here is right. Like you talked about, you talked about early on <clears throat> in that in that quote and in in, uh, in your comments before it about eliminating having the government be so small that it can be drowned in the bathtub, et cetera, and eliminating taxes. Um, you know what you get when you do that? You get a plantation. You get what you get the Confederacy. Like that yeah. is that is the that is what that is. That is feudalism. That mm-hmm. means that there is no government that overarching government powerful enough to check individual financial interests. And so essentially businessmen run the entire world. I mean, in, in some sense, the the expanse kind of does this too, right? Where yeah. big corporations are so big and so powerful, they essentially, you don't even identify as a person from a different uh, country as the, 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 or the company you work for. Like that's part right. of your identity. That's like part, that is, that is more than the country. Right. And yeah. it's really, and one of the things is, is trying, and one of the themes is certainly early in the show is clawing back that power from the corporations, right? Like, like, uh, what's her face? The, um, that, the, the amazing woman that Christian, the, uh, Oh my God. But yeah. like she goes and says, like, you know, we are the government, we can freeze your assets. But like, but again, that tension is what the liberal, the libertarians absolutely hate. But in terms of this particular quote, Sean, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't even know what to say about it other than to say that the government does play racial fav- fav- favorites. Yeah. It plays for to white people. Yeah. And wealthy absolutely. white people. So don't, don't talk to, that's what, it's so disingenuous for him to say, oh yeah, by the way, don't play favorites. Why are you fucking kidding me? You're just saying don't play favorites to those people. You're no, they're just going like, to flip it. Exactly. That's all. That's all. And it's just such bad faith. I mean, I, the, the racism is just so evident that anybody can just hear it. I don't have to comment on that specifically other than to say like, wow, just wow. And the way that he justifies this intellectually is what's, again, I'm going to keep coming back to that theme. That is so so dangerous because it gives people something to hang their hat on. Right libertarians are like this. They mm-hmm. they, they think they're smart. They, 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 they're like, oh, no, I'm driven by data. What are you talking about? You know, yeah. but it's always in bad faith in service of this hierarchical view of the world. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about how what what he actually says here. Sure. And and the data. And he begins by discussing America's racial makeup through the demographic breakdown of four major racial groups. He really only talks about four, which mm-hmm. is, which is Europeans, 60 percent, Latins, 18 percent, Africans, 13 percent. Asians, 6%. And the other 4% is a mixture of smaller groups, including Native Americans, who he doesn't really talk that much about in the book. But he then turns to what he calls a transformation of American society that began about 1960. And this is the big beef, okay? It's not just the mm-hmm. Civil Rights Act. It is, it is the immigration that started happening in around 1960. He says, quote, New York City went from 77% European in 1960 to 32% in 2019. That's a transformation by any definition. Other major cities changed even more than New York did. From 1960 to 2019, Los Angeles went from 85% European to 29%. Chicago went from 82 to 34%. Houston went from 77 to 23%. All the rhetoric about the racial diversity of America is true for big cities. Since big city America contains so many of our Africans, Latins, and Asians, the percentages for America outside the big cities are much different. The European percentage rises from 45 to 71 percent, while the Latin and African percentages fall to 14 percent and 10 percent, respectively. The narrative tells us that America is moving toward a multiracial society in which Europeans will soon be a minority and we all need to adjust in similar ways. The reality is that different parts of America have had widely varying experience with a multiracial society and are moving toward even more different futures, end quote. So. We see right away where this is going. He's he's taking us through this very scary narrative about how our nation is becoming more racially polarized, our cities are becoming browner and heading toward being ungovernable. And he holds up, he t- creates this whole divide. This is where a lot of the Republican urbophobia comes from. Mm-hmm. That that mm-hmm. America, you know, a, a lot of people think that real America is this part of the country that's still white and that cities are this are these shitholes. And it's just we've seen this narrative sharpening over the last few you know years and decades to the point where it's just openly being said now that conservatives just hate cities mm-hmm. and 
uh, and cities have blue mayors. You know, they have Democratic mayors. And so there's there. This is a huge change in our country to where even even from 10 years ago, we didn't hear this kind of stuff. So the blue on this first map are Europeans. The red, black people, orange are Latinos, uh, green are Native Americans, and gray are Asians. Purple areas are major metropolitan areas. And a lot of Murray's critique of non-whites you know, leads him to this focus on, on the large cities that I just mentioned. So we're all kind of familiar with this rightward shift of American politics that happened between 1996 and 2016. It's, it's like tectonic shift in, in America mm. over that time. And we have a, a good idea as to why this happened. Looking at the next two maps, we see vast swaths of low population counties in America's heartland that went from blue to red over the course of the 20 year period. And, you know, he Murray says that this increased polarization is primarily a backlash against government racial preferences, particularly in urban areas that he considers unfair to white Europeans. But I'm just wondering, because I'm looking at these maps, Christoph, and I mean, can you think of some other things that might have happened in those 20 years that might explain these maps? Oh, uh, boy. Well, first of all, let's go back to why these um, the, the cities changed in the first place. White flight, right? 1960, uh -huh. 1964, the, and I'm sorry, the, um, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, uh, and, the, and most importantly, most importantly, the desegregation of schools. That's mm -hmm. why. That's why they, white people left. They left, right? But, and, and so, and, but, the real issue here um, in terms of the question you just asked, right? I mean, like this all coincides perfectly with the rise of right wing talk radio. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing that jumps to my mind, cable news and the radicalization of white people. Right. And yeah. they have been they've been told since the early 90s that black people and brown people are coming to take their jobs and they're mooching off the government. And there's and, and not even that. Let's go back to it's the fucking 80s, the 80s, Reagan, Ray, Reagan and the um, and the yeah. and the. The crack epidemic and um, and welfare queens and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that is why. That is why. The, the idea that he decides that this has to do with a backlash or racial preferences. I mean, maybe, maybe, but only because those those uh, you know those uh, those attempts to elevate poor people who are disproportionately people of color have been demonized by the right-wing propaganda machine. I mean, of course, well, unbelievable, astonishing conclusion that he draws there. It's astonishing. He doesn't even mention the fact that in 1996 is when Fox News launched and they're exactly. they immediately started <laughs> in on attacking the Clinton administration and, and yeah. you know, the, the impeachment coverage for him was like a, a huge deal for them. And, and also the election of Barack Obama, right? Oh my God, of so, course. <laughs> you know, these, the, it's just, he is transparently, a, you know, revising history and, you know, blaming black people and liberals basically for this polarization. Exactly. And here's another quote. That's he says, funny. This is, he's like, this could have nothing to do with the white people. But this is <laughs> that's just an astonishing thing. This, I mean, you know, we talk about how he's intellectually honest in some sense, uh, but then it's like, but then he comes to these conclusions that are just so intellectually dishonest. Like, come on, man. Well, and the next thing he says here, he's basically talking about how dangerous it is for black people to ask for their rights. Here he goes. Mm. He says, Statements about white privilege and systemic racism coming from black opinion leaders have always seemed self-defeating. Blacks constituting 13% of the population are telling whites who are 60% of the population that they are racist, bad people, the cause of bla all blacks problems, and that they had better change their ways or else. Right or wrong, that rhetoric has been guaranteed to produce backlash by some portion of the 60% against the 13%, end quote. So in other words, he's telling black people to accept the status quo because exactly. if they try to change it, the white majority will make the country ungovernable. And he's justifying that. And he, what he's really I mean, he's not wrong, by the way, because that's literally what's happening. That is what's happening. Got, but he's justifying it. He's saying, oh, well, then just don't ask. Wait, what? That's the conclusion you draw from that? Well, when they say don't be divisive, what they're really asking us to do is to go back to that old pre-civil rights New Deal compromise that allowed so-called bipartisanship to mm -hmm. support generous social benefits. Mm -hmm. um, this is something Jonathan, Jonathan Chait talked about, and we talked about it in one of our other episodes. This compromise lasted for like 100 years where black people weren't getting any rights. Right. And so finally that changed and that has just set all of this chain of events in motion. Mm -hmm. I mean, Eisenhower, the Republican 1956 platform is basically the current Democratic platform. So it's just, wow. 
and, and that all changed after civil rights. So, mm -hmm. but instead of belaboring what we already know, I want to get right into Murray's data that he uses to justify reversing equal employment opportunity and affirmative action policies. He begins by presenting detailed information about IQ tests administered from just after the Civil Rights Act up to the present. He goes into all sorts of detail about methodologies I'm not going to get into here. He also addresses common objections to the validity of IQ tests in general. And of all the things that Charles Murray talks about in his book, I find his documentation of IQ to be the most defensible because he has large sample sizes and the results mm -hmm. are consistent over broad geographical areas. You, you can't make up that kind of data and I'm not being right. facetious. Right. Uh, it's pretty clear that the IQ differences exist and mm -hmm. you know whether IQ is as determinative of social outcomes as he claims is another story. But so here we go looking at this chart real briefly. You know, we have the mm -hmm. mean IQ, which is the another way of saying the average. Europeans 103, African 91, Latin 94, Asian is 108. So Asia always Asians always come out on top on this, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's also true. And where I part company with Murray in a major way is about the causes of these IQ differences and potential mm -hmm. cures. And Christoph, you already talked about this at pretty good length in your episode we did last year. Do you want to do like a two minute recap of, of what you said and your take on this? Because these differences are really substantial. They are substantial and they matter. Um, and, and the gist of it is, and I, I, I touched on this briefly and I won't get too much into it, but the bottom line is that like, you know, genetics are genetics, right? G IQ derives from genetics. If you have people who have a consistently disadvantaged and right, and, and we know that we know that environment also effect, environment also affects genetics, right? So we know that these things are true. If you have a bunch of people who are, by the way, isolated, so you can't, uh, black people can only marry black people for, and, and uh, for literally, legally, literally only marry black people for most of the time black people have been on the American continent. There has been, um, uh, you know, concerted efforts to, to, to maintain, to make sure folks didn't get educated, smart, and when these folks then marry each other and have children, you are on average going to get people with lower IQs. I mean, it's not it's not rocket science, really. It's kind of obvious when you think of it that way. Um, and and the real question thing we should be talking about here is the reasons that this happens. And there is no scientific data to prove that this is some sort of somehow inherent to right. To, to, that is somehow biologically inevitable. There is absolutely no evidence. And that is the big logical leap that guys like Murray and, of course, the entire right wing make all of the time. Yeah. And I want to digress also just briefly and talk about mm -hmm. what the actual bell curve looks like, because sure. it's not what I thought. I mean, it, it, you know, basically you've got two bell curves and I, I thought that they would just be like slightly offset from each other, one overlaid over the other. But because of the small population of Africans and, and Latinos and Asians in America, their, their little bell curves are, are at the bottom kind of inside of the main sort of right. overall population bell curve. And so it's not like you think. It's it really we're very cognitively uh, homogenous here. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. all of the even the outliers among among black people and Latinos and Asians are underneath the main bell curve. And so right. it's not like you've got a whole big difference that's happening here. It's, it's, it's really kind of overblown. Uh, it, it, like, it's, yeah. And also like segregation, right? Se like we can't talk about this without talking about segregation, right? Because if you have an insular community, an insular community that doesn't get to, 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 to mix genes in with the rest of the community, I mean, you're going to have a small pocket. And that happens whether that's wealthy white people, right, mm -hmm. who are on average smarter, right, who are mm -hmm. on average, not only that, better looking, on average, better looking. That is, mm -hmm. a, that is a crazy. So, again, this is then, uh, then, then non-white, then, then, sorry, then poor white people. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so the, the, we have these social groups that are so homogenous. And in the United States, it's exacerbated because it's by law for, for many years and now by de facto. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so here we are. So anyway, I just wanted to jump in on that. But it is it is it is we can't talk about and this is what they try to do. They try and compartmentalize this as if we can talk about these these numbers without talking about the reasons why on the front end, why this happened, why this is like it is. And then on the back end, what we should do about it. Right. Those are the two parts where they have absolutely wrong. They have that like right, the actual numbers are the actual numbers. 
Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of white liberals and liberals generally have a problem with IQ Mm-hmm, as a, mm-hmm, as a concept, mm-hmm. they don't like IQ testing. Sure. They don't like standardized testing. They don't like putting people in boxes. They, you know, they, sure. they, they're they worried about what Charles Murray is precisely doing here is that IQ tests are going to be used to, you know, to argue against social progress. And mm. so I want to, but I want to read something here from the American Psychological Association because they debunk this. They actually say that IQ is very determinative. And mm. um, this is part so of our post, our, our, our post-liberal, post-liberalism philosophy that we're developing here. Yeah. And, and so Murray quotes this in his book just as a way of, of, of beefing up sort of the credibility of, of IQ. And so here's the APA. They say, intelligence tests predict school performance fairly well, at least in American schools as they are now constituted. Similarly, achievement tests are fairly good predictors of performance in college and postgraduate settings. Considered in this light, the relevant question is whether the tests have a predictive bias against blacks. Such a bias would exist if African-American performance on the criterion variables were systematically higher than the same subject's test scores would predict. This is not the case. The actual regression lines, which show the mean criterion performance for individuals who got various scores on the predictor for blacks do not lie above those for whites. So hmm. this validates IQ as, as, a, as a measurement. And I, I, I wholly agree with that. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. I think that's right. And, and you know, in predictability in terms of, I know this from the law school context, right? Uh, the uh, the LSAT is a really good predictor of how people will do in their first year of law school, like a really solid predictor that's been consistent. And it's, it's, it's just true. Yeah. Well, Murray also argues in his book that we've run up against a hard limit to educational intervention to raise IQs. And he this is what he uses. He, there's a chart where he documents how IQ differences between Europeans and Africans began to decrease after the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Because they started testing, they started throwing money at schools. Mm-hmm. Um, but then this the decrease leveled off around 1990. And now the differences have remained constant at about one, one standard deviation ever since 1990. And so this is where I think Murray makes his worst error. Instead of trying to find further interventions that might help reduce these IQ disparities further, he just declares failure. He's basically spending an entire book to tell us that this is just the way it is. It's sort of a, the poor you will have with you always kind of an attitude toward cognition of non-white Americans. And here's what we haven't tried. We haven't tried a multi-generational approach to comprehensively rooting out the conditions that contribute to poverty and lowered cognitive ability. Mm -hmm. Everything done so far, including no child left behind has involved Band-Aids and half measures, Band-Aids on a fucking bullet wound, man. And exactly. We still tie school funding to local property taxes. Uh, too many black parents still live under shameful conditions that cause enormous stress on their children and that lead to lost cognitive opportunity. Black parents still speak far fewer words to their children than white parents do because mm-hmm. black parents are often not home, specifically right. because they have to work so hard due to lower wages. Or I didn't even want to say this, but because it's so horrible, but they're, you know, dads have been arrested. Mm hmm. It's true. Not there. So black kids still have worse nutrition by far than their white counterparts. Black kids still experience far higher levels of domestic and street violence. And we know that trauma also causes brain damage. And the stagnation of black IQ scores also coincides with Republican budget cuts. Yes. The Republican war exactly. on teachers unions. The exactly. right-wing hatred of the National Education Association, the long-term Republican efforts to defund and sabotage public schools and shift money to private schools. It's not like, you know, like he acts as if suddenly, oh, we put all, through all this money at it and it's not getting better. No, you deliberately tried to make it worse. <laughs> exactly. You literally cut all of this stuff. So, I mean, like, uh, yeah, I'll, well, finish your thought and then I'll comment. Yeah, I mean, I'm 100% confident that IQ differences are not fundamentally race related and that we still haven't done enough to build a society where we can actually realize that. Mm -hmm. Every part of Murray's approach says that we just have to accept things as they are and therefore we have to accept that black people in every profession are going to have a lower average IQ than whites. That's the way it is now, but there's no reason we have to accept that that's how it has to be. So I just want to take a look briefly at this chart of Mm. IQ in various professions. And it starts out all the way at the top like with accountants. And, you know, European accountants have an IQ of 111 on average, whereas uh, African accountants have an IQ of 100 and goes all the way down to janitors where uh, European janitors have 92 and African janitors have a 79. So this and this is across the board. I would talk about, you know, retail, child care workers, secretaries, mechanics, um, 
K to 12 teachers, registered nurses, these IQ disparities show up across all employment tiers. So I just, I mean, this is, this is a snapshot of how it is, not how it has to be. I think that's right, um, obviously. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of, um, again, uh, the Black Reconstruction in America, and he talks about this a lot, right? That um, African uh, Af enslaved, j literally just recently emancipated African, uh, enslaved Africans were, um, you know, were uh, you know, not only just not a lot of different things. First of all, not uh, hip to um, how government works or how society works, right? They weren't part of it. They were not, um, uh, not and obviously not educated, um, perhaps not like uh, couth, right? Like not, didn't have, they weren't genteel, right? They were kind of rough and around the edges. And none of that is surprising. Like none of that is surprising, right? And so we are just, I'm just extrapolating that up till now, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it's still true that black people have been oppressed, right? So um, I, I'm reminded to, when you talk about that sort of threshold, 1990. Um, so I, this is going to be a weird analogy, but everybody roll with me. So I cut my hair and I cut my hair short on the sides and not on the top, right? A kind of like a, a, like a Mohawk type thing. And on the sides, it grows back really fucking fast. Right. And so on the top though, like when my hair gets to a certain length, it noticeably slows down and it mm -hmm. takes a long time for it to be obvious that it's growing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, this is, a, I'm making the analogy here to basically from 1865 up to 1990, you had a lot of growth there that mm -hmm. needed to happen, right? Immediate growth. So you're going to get an explosion. It's the same thing with the economy, by the way, right? The economy comes back from a recession really fast, but then the growth stops, slows, right? And yeah. then it takes a lot, it's a lot harder to keep that growth going after that, right? It takes it takes new strategies, it takes new approaches. Um, and the same is true, I think. I mean, I'm thinking that, I'm just thinking about this now, but I'm thinking that, the, that, that it might be the case here as well. I'll, uh, and at then that at that exact same time, we're talking about the 80s and the 90s when these programs were slashed and the budgets were slashed and the new normal became everybody fend for themselves. Yeah. And if you know, if you look at what happened right after the Civil Rights Act, they did all this IQ testing. They wanted to find out what's working, what's not working about our schools and all that. And then they 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 fixed a lot of low hanging fruit problems that were easy right, to fix exactly. that they could just immediately fix. Okay. Let's, let's, let's desegregate. Let's uh, you know, and all of that stuff had an immediate impact that helped raise IQ scores. But mm -hmm. then now you've got the more intractable problems that exactly. have not yet been done. And this guy is making this conclusion that because of that, that we should just stop just stop. Like it's just what a crazy, I mean, it's not a crazy conclusion if what you want is a hierarchical environment, right? It's not, but yeah. like, but if for, for, for people like you and me, it's like, well, why would you stop there? Like under what circumstances would you say like, all right, well, you know, we, we made it to, I don't know, like, I mean, it, it's so anti the way the human spirit is. We always want to keep going further. We want to explore more. We want to know more. We want to, we want to accumulate more. Why would we just stop here? Unless, unless that's what you want here. And that's what you want. Exactly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Murray notes in the book that there's two areas where IQ differences are greatly reduced or even disappear. And the first is among people who have taken the U S medical licensing exam which is a super fucking hard test. Mm. And the second is in the US military, where in many cases, black soldiers perform better than whites on cognitive tests. And his reasoning is that in both these cases, lower performers have already been eliminated. You know, like, like they, they washed out of med school or whatever, mm -hmm. or in the army, the mm -hmm. army, they couldn't hack it, right? So that's, that's what he's kind of saying. And he uses this as his sort of entree into the argument for getting rid of equal employment opportunity and preferential school admissions for black people, because he believes that if we evaluate everyone based solely on their performance and aptitude, that that's going to make a better society for both blacks and whites. And he argues that the preferential treatment for blacks in employment and education is actually worse for the very people that it's trying to help. And so he says here, and this is one example that, you know, maybe he's got somewhat of a point in this one. And that is, he says, Universities draw from the talent pool in a hierarchy. African and Latin students with combined SATs in the 1500s are admitted everywhere they apply, but they tend to accept the most elite school on their list, which is Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. 
and have a lot of extraordinarily talented minority students, and they thin out the pool for the next schools in line. So to me, it does raise an important issue. How do we achieve the goal of improving African and Latino representation, not just in America's top jobs, but across the board, if many of the top candidates concentrate at just a few Ivy League schools? Because I want all of America's colleges to include top black students. And if they're not, it's a lot of wasted slots and wasted opportunity. Also, it seems like at second tier non Ivy League schools, this would put a lot of black students admitted through affirmative action in the lower percentiles of their class compared to white students at those schools. So what do you think, Christoph? Can we eliminate these preferences? And is that going to help or hurt black people to do so? I think that we need to we need to look at these critically for sure. I think this is part of again back to my post liberal uh, perspective is that we need to be critical about these things, not just have the uh, sort of knee jerk reaction, um, which is I think typical for us on the left for this because right uh, on on issues like this on IQ or on affirmative action et cetera. But I have thought about this a great deal, and I and the and I don't have data. Uh, I'm not a data scientist or anything like that, and I don't claim to be or a statistical um, genius of it or any kind, but um, or even really knowledgeable. But I will say this, and that is, you know, a couple things. First of all, from my experience, you know, I can say being th- I got thrown into the into the deep end at Georgetown. It was it was you know I don't know that I got in because of any preferential treatment at all. I don't think that I did. I mean, I, I earned the scores and stuff like that, but I gained, but I did. But, but, but the analogy I'm making here is that I came from a, 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 a Montclair State University, a state school, right? And so I'm um, going to, I didn't go grow up in this environment that was sort of geared toward that world, right? Um, and this is true for many black students, for me, for different reasons, way different reasons than it is for most black students. Um, but most black students aren't growing up in an environment that they're, that they're being groomed essentially to go to a place like Georgetown or like like the really top schools like Harvard, Yale, et cetera. Um, and so I floundered, I think in the first year, I really, really did, but then I got my sea legs. And, mm-hmm. so, and, and so I don't, yeah, I understand the argument. And this is Clarence Thomas's argument, by the way. Um, oh, is it? This is this is Clarence Thomas's exact argument that, like, uh, you know, that he has that as a really really smart black guy, he has gotten uh, impugned because people think that he got where he got because of um, because of affirmative action. And on the other hand, that affirmative action and things like this and equal opportunity actually hurt black people. But I think that's bullshit because I think that when you let that that black kid in to um, and even the black kid that doesn't get into Yale, but gets that ends up going to UCLA instead. Right. And what you do, though, is you are throwing them into the social environment Mm -hmm. in which they can elevate themselves. And what ends up happening is that that kid who got into uh, didn't get into Yale and got into UCLA is going to have a child. And he's going to marry. He's going to marry somebody that's in that same social class. Mm-hmm. Have a kid that's also in that social class, and will be better able to compete and get into Yale or get into US, UCLA. My point is that allowing people into the club is part of is a huge part of this that's overlooked. It's not just how they perform at school. It's mm-hmm. the people they talk to. It is the world that they get injected into. Sean. Right. That is so fucking important. That is so, I went to a big law firm because I went to Georgetown, even though I didn't get particularly great first year grades, I mm-hmm. still went to a big law firm and I got the credibility that comes along with going to a big law firm. I met the people that you meet, the people that I went to law school with, like it elevates people. And again, I, I'm a bad example because the reasons why I was sort of behind have nothing to do with like aren't like intelligence or class base is because my parents were my parents and things happened in the church and everything else. And yeah, I also had my own personal struggles with drugs and everything like that. So that's why I was so far behind. You know, I was actually on track to be groomed for that if everything it, had it gone ha- normally. It helped pull you up. Exactly. Is, is being that's given that opportunity helped you, helped you come up and and overcome some of those challenges that you were struggling with. Exactly. And that's why it's so fucking critical. It allows you in a club that you wouldn't be in otherwise. And that and then when you have kids down the road, you're going to have kids into that club. Right. That yeah. is how over generations you pull people up. 
Well, and this is this is the argument, though, is that and I'm going to read this next. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it, basically, his summation of his chapters on on employment and education is the following where he says, I think it's fair to conclude that the American job market is indeed racially biased. A detached observer might even call it systemic racism. The American job market systemically discriminates in favor of racial minorities other than Asians. And this is, end quote, this is the big deal with college admissions, too, because he's saying, sure. OK, well, if these slots are going to black people preferentially, then it's going to deny that, you know, these Asians or whites who are sm who are smarter uh, and we're going to have a, you know, a less intelligent workforce. And so I, I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are costs for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how I think about that is that there are costs, but they're also historically disadvantaged folks. And now with Asian families and Asian kids, I mean, that can be a little bit complicated, right? Because Asian folks have been discriminated against in this country as almost as long as black folks have. So um, I, I understand that there's complexity here, um, but the numbers don't lie. The numbers are that we have an entire group of people who has who has who has a unique history in the United States that helped build the United States that helped that is that is the that continues to be the underclass in the United States. And, you know, this is the argument for reparations as well. It's like, yeah, I get that it's unfair, but oh, my God, unfair. You want to talk about unfair. It's been, yeah. it's been, it was unfair for 500 years. What are you fucking talking about? So yeah, yeah, it is unfair and that does suck. But guess what? This is what it feels like to be on the unfair side of things. Welcome right. to the fucking club. Well, and also Asians, they have the IQ scores. They have the test scores. They have a lot more options. Exactly. That's very true too. It's very, very true too. Exactly. So, okay, let's move on to crime. Um, it's beyond dispute. As we already said, uh, black crime statistics are off the charts compared to white crime statistics and even other minorities. We've got disparities in America's largest cities that are from five to one to 10 to one to even 20 to one. And so uh, I posted I have this graph in here about it. And it's you know, it's just it's it's horrifying. It's like it, it just mm -hmm. you, you have a hard time believing it, but it it's apparently true. So, you know, there's been an extensive amount of work done on the sociology of crime and I'm not an expert in that, but I don't think it's at all controversial to say that systematic disparities in educational outcomes, poverty, poor nutrition, and economic inequality themselves go a long way toward explaining these horrific crime figures, not to mention America's incredibly lax gun laws. So rather than being a measure of some sort of deterministic black racial essentialism that justifies harsher treatment, High crime statistics are actually, to me, evidence of prolonged and stubborn systemic racism. In, in many ways, it's like what Martin Luther King said about riots. Crime is the language of the unheard. And mm -hmm. uh, I know that's a super shocking thing to say. I know it sounds like that's I'm justifying crime. I'm not. I can't help saying this because when I hear about high black crime statistics, what I feel isn't outrage, but it's compassion. I'm thinking to myself, how bad must conditions have to be in these neighborhoods in American cities that black people feel so hopeless that crime is the best they can do for themselves? How bad must the effects have been of things we've heard about, like building freeways through black neighborhoods or redlining, uh, uh, bad schools, uh, dozens to hundreds of race massacres that occurred in our cities over the past hundred years? I mean, what the fuck? Yeah, I mean, and I mean, all that is right. And and again, the numbers are the numbers. They do not lie. And I, I have I, I've said this many, many times. I'll say it again. And that is, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, on average, black people commit more crimes. I mean, I, that those are just the numbers. But again, we have to look at we have to get back to causes and conditions. <clears throat> and we talked we've talked about um on the show, I think we've talked about this, and Steven Pinker talks about this too, um, in 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 some of in one of one of his books that I've read, and that is right that uh, in the absence of uh, there's an honor culture that sort of evolves out of lawlessness, and so when you cannot trust the Leviathan, when you cannot trust the police force, the economic mm -hmm. system to provide for you, you resort to self help, right? This is what libertarians love. This stuff, right? This is what this yeah. is what you love, right? This is what they love, right? <laughs> like, oh uh, yeah, let the, resorting to self help, right? So basically, when you cannot, when you can't 
trust the the system to provide for you. You create your own system. And basically that is what black culture has become, has, has, uh, has evolved to be. Um, and then that's separate from the, there, there's the black culture element from, you know, from, from names to eyelashes, to nails, to music. And then there's also then just the criminal element, which is a separate element, by the way, which is frequently conflated. Those things are not the same, right? There is the, there's a criminal element and then there's a cultural element that's developed, right? right. Um, they, they may or may not overlap, but they're not the same thing. And, um, and the crime is like, again, it's a self-help thing. Like, right. You know, if yeah. you, if, and, and again, it becomes an honor culture. This happens in the this happened this happened in the in the plantation south. This happened in the in the wild west when there isn't a strong centralized government that can that can mete out punishment and keep things in line. People result to self help. That's what happens, and that's what I see. That's what I see in these neighborhoods. That's what I see in these numbers. Yeah, and of course, also, I mean, it just goes without saying that if you have a choice between you know working uh, McDonald's at minimum wage or yeah. slinging, slinging dope on a corner where you can you know take home you know hundreds of dollars you mm-hmm. know at a time, I, I think it's just obvious what people are going to do. And yeah, okay, it's wrong; they're breaking the law. But you know, if you're a kid and you're trying to get ahead, you're trying to be somebody in the neighborhood, yeah. right? You're, you're, it's like everybody wants to be somebody. Yeah. Well, I want to also then touch on one of the most heavily studied measures of social and economic inequality, which is the Gini coefficient. Mm. And I did an index search on Murray's book. I read the whole thing too, but I also just wanted to make sure that uh, Gini coefficient is not mentioned anywhere, not a single word. And here's what it is and why it's important. Uh, The Gini coefficient measures the economic inequality of a nation on a scale from zero to one. Zero would be perfect equality. And one would be a single person having all the money and everything, everyone else having nothing. So every nation is on that scale. Okay. Now this is important. The Gini coefficient does not measure percentile distributions. You can get the same Gini coefficient from a large number of different distributions, but what it does measure is overall generalized economic inequality. It's sort of a shorthand for how wide the gap is between the average rich and the average poor in society. And Here's another important thing to recognize about the Gini coefficient is that there is a separate value for wealth versus income inequality. They're Mm. likely to be related, but income and wealth disparities arise from different kinds of policies. So today we're going to focus on income inequality and its relationship to crime. And here are four scatter plots that I'm going to put up. And this Mm -hmm. is from an article in The Economist from 2018. And basically, The scatter plots document the strong relationship globally between income inequality and four measures of crime. And they are, do people lack confidence in local police? Mm -hmm. Do they feel safe walking home alone? Have they had money or property stolen? And have they been assaulted? So unsurprisingly, reports of each of these situations become much higher, the higher the level of economic inequality is in a given country. And this analysis tracks consistently around the world on every continent. And here is a quote from the article. 50 years ago, Gary Becker, a Nobel Prize winning economist, advanced an argument that all crime is economic and all criminals are rational. Becker's seminal Mm -hmm. paper, Crime and Punishment, an Economic Approach, posited that would-be criminals make a cost-benefit assessment of the likely rewards from breaking the law against the probability of being caught and punished. In Becker's world of utility-maximizing miscreants, places that have larger gaps between the poor, the would-be criminals, and the rich, who are the victims, will, all other things being equal, have higher crime. Now, Mm. this makes eminent sense to me. This is like the most obvious thing in the world, but the guy won a Nobel Prize for figuring it out. And what do you think this says about Murray's attempts to promote the idea that America's inner city crime is race based? Well, it just goes to what I was saying before above. Right. And that is like, you know, if you take any group of people and you put them in the position of where black people are now, mm-hmm. um, you, know, you will get a similar result. Like this isn't it has nothing to do with individuals race. I mean, it has all these factors. We, we, we just went through these factors. It's really an astonishing thing that you mentioned. Right. It, it's almost it tracks what I just said. Lack of confidence in local police. Don't feel safe walking home to have mm-hmm. money. Is, right. Basically, you do not have stability. You do not have stability. You cannot trust the government. Um, and this is exacerbated, obviously, for black folks, just given the history. But if you put any person, I mean, this is also true, by the way, if you went to uh, poor white people, 
you're going to get really similar. You're going to get really similar results. And of course, I understand that the numbers are far, are far worse for Black folks, poor Black folks, but poor white folks. I mean, I was all, I've been really taken aback by seeing like the the marriage numbers of, of, of poor mm-hmm. white folks. It is really very close to marriage numbers among poor Black folks. And again, it's because in those circumstances. This is the sort of culture that tends to develop in these environments. I mean, that I, I don't because there is no science in the race and in, in, in biological race. There's no real science there. So we must find answers elsewhere. And the only other answers, I think, come to social environmental factors. Yeah, it has to be. And it also has to do with concentration. I think the fact that there Mm. has been redlining and there's been segregation in this country and you have ghettos, you know, there are there are there are probably not uh, too many places where there are, you know, only poor white people living concentrated into a very small area. Right. Right. (laughs) Exactly. I don't think I don't think there's I think there's so many ways to tear this apart sociologically if you really looked into it. And yeah. um, and you know, that, that's, really, that's really important what you said, right? Because black people were herded into ghettos mm-hmm. in the 60s and the 70s, right? Like, and and redlined into ghettos, right? So you have people living on top of each other like that. And yeah, I think that is a really, really in, in important fact. And, you know, I think it's really telling too that white, we are now talking about white people dying de- uh, deaths of despair. We talk yes. about income, in, uh, de- income inequality, right? And that has been exacerbated. And as that's happened, that poverty has seeped not now it's not just black people right, right. dying in uh, from the crack epidemic right it is also now white people because that's how bad the, the, the things have had things have things have gotten in terms of um that inequality yeah and this is this is the plan of neoliberalism i mean it, this is this is what they wanted is to yeah. just make people so poor and desperate that they would turn on each other and that they would give up hope and so that's yep. that's exactly and what's happening. Not happened. vote, not vote, not participate in this in the process. Exactly what you want if you're looking for minority rule. Yeah, and notably, Charles Murray also ignores that there might be a, a rational basis for crime in the minds of people who've been left behind by the free enterprise system. Right? Exactly. In America, he goes right to genetics and essentialism immediately. You know, mm-hmm. uh, although he goes in his book, he goes to great lengths to talk about how people feel unsafe and are disproportionately victims of crimes in areas with high black and Latino populations, he short circuits his analysis by claiming basically that no matter how much the government throws at these neighborhoods, they haven't gotten any better. And he, he goes as, so far as to claim that the very land itself in inner cities is devalued by the presence of minority populations. And his proposal, unsurprisingly, is to get rid of those populations through gentrification. I shit you not. I mean, he actually says this. Here's a quote. He says, Attempts to stimulate economic growth in places with high crime rates work only in places that are gentrifying or can be gentrified. Over the decades since the 1960s, federal and municipal governments have periodically introduced programs that offer economic incentives for businesses to invest in the inner city. The most recent example consists of the Opportunity Zones enacted as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. The act offers capital gains, tax breaks for investments in about 8,700 designated Opportunity Zones. The academic analyses of the results so far suggest that this initiative is producing the same unintended outcomes that have characterized previous efforts. The land occupied by the inner city really is potentially worth a lot of money if, but only if, the minority residents are replaced through gentrification. End Holy quote. fucking God. Wow. Wow. Where are these people supposed to go, man? I mean, <laughs> according to Charles Murray, it seems they'll cause the same problems wherever they go. That's his that's his answer. So gentrifying them out of existence seems to me to be a blatant call for elimination, which mm-hmm. strikes me to being dangerously close to calling for genocide. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, I think the answer is like, right. The question is, where do you want these people to go? I, I asked, I, I hinted at that earlier on. Like, if you're a libertarian, like what? do you want these people to do like and the only other question is like just disappear which just me i don't that sounds that sounds terrifying that terrifying. sounds terrifying um you know it, it is i think it's really interesting too is that like you throw money at a like you you talk about a bandit on a bullet hole on, on a bullet hole uh bullet wound earlier and that is that's what these sort of tax breaks are like that's not investing in the community and the people no. that are there that's in that's investing in 
Uh, and like, I don't know, whatever business owner wants to go into that neighborhood, that's really different. Like if, like if people there don't have any money to buy products, if they don't have any hope, then what the fuck do you expect is going to happen? Of course, that's what's going to happen. These are not solutions. These are band-aids. Well, and, and that's and that's exactly what they're doing. The entire purpose of half measures is to say, see, we tried and we failed. Yep, exactly. Well, we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, actually, we've kind of gone over, but <laughs> I really want to <laughs> nail the core of this book for what it is. Charles Murray is providing academic cover to naked threats by the American white majority and by extension, the wealthy to make the United States ungovernable as a multicultural nation. And so what this book is then is a policy manual for white minority rule through a combination of undemocratic tactics that range from voter suppression to outright violence and treason, such as we saw on January 6th, 2021. And if the country does become ungovernable, of course, we know who we're supposed to blame. Um, <laughs> Murray justifies this by painting a lurid picture of what would happen if the structures of white supremacy break down by using the most racist of all metaphors, the return to the jungle. Unbelievable. His, his last chapter is titled, If We Don't Face Reality. And this is where his victim complex is really exposed and his true agenda is revealed to be far more than an academic exercise and where he uses the most purple prose that veers into polemic. He says, quote, the new ideologues of the far left are akin to the red guards of Mao's great proletarian cultural revolution of the 1960s, and they are coming for all of us. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Scholars are criticized not for the quality of their work, but for its failure to advance the cause of social justice. Work seen as hostile to that cause is met with calls for the scholar's dismissal. The pushback has been so feeble in part because no one has been willing to say the systemically racist America you portray doesn't exist. Identity politics is an existential threat to the American experiment. If working class and middle class whites adopt identity politics, disaster follows. The American experiment is fragile. It has always been fragile and always will be fragile because it is so extremely unnatural. Unnatural in this context means in conflict with human nature. Jonah Goldberg has described the fragility of the American system by comparing it to a garden hacked out of a tropical jungle. A garden surrounded by jungle is unnatural. The gardeners must tend it with unremitting care, lest the jungle return. America proved that a durable alternative to the natural form of government was possible, a constitutional republic combined with carefully circumscribed democracy. The introduction. Carefully circumcised, circumscribed. What does he mean by that? I don't what know. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so he concludes, this is like the, like the closing paragraph. The introduction of identity politics into that carefully craft, crafted constitutional system does not simply distract us from warding off the jungle. It is the jungle, the primitive sense of us against them pressing in upon the garden. It not only permits, but insists that the power of the state be used to reward favored groups at the expense of everyone else. Holy shit. <laughs> I just, I, what do you even say to that? Like, you know, what do you even say to something like that? It's uh, circumscribed democracy. I mean, that is basically yeah. just saying the quiet part out loud. Right? They're all saying the quiet part out loud. I mean, from from Trump all the way down, they're all saying it now. They, they mean, don't want everybody to vote. They don't want everybody to vote. I mean, that is what they're saying. And this idea that, it, you know, that and, you know, the fundamental one of the fundamental flaws There's a lot of fundamental flaws here. But one of the, the, the most galling ones is this idea that there hasn't been a preferred group in this country. What yeah. are you talking about? The entire history of this country is the uh, is the oppression of everyone else by a preferred group. Identity yeah. politics, whiteness has been part uh, has been the unspoken part of identity politics since the fucking very beginnings, the beginning of this country. It has been unspoken identity identity politics. Fuck that. That is bullshit. Every white person from the very beginning knows they're not black, right? Yeah. Don't tell me like they know everybody knows that. Right. And every black person knows they're not white. And so it's basically what he's doing is trying to ignore the systemic built in hierarchies that are part of this country. And like we said, on the top of the show, have been intentionally crafted in this country over yeah. and over again. And he just ignores it and says, 
oh, now you want to talk, now all of a sudden they're doing this, all, all this identity politics. Again, saying the quiet part out loud. It is that it was, and that is an astonishing, astonishing quote, man. That is just, it makes me sick. Yeah, and, and that's not even the worst of it. His final words in the book represent the ultimate revisionist history that America was founded as a nation of equality under the law to which he implores <laughs> us to return. And we know that's not true. We there is no return. <laughs> the only return there is, is to outright white supremacy and wealth supremacy. I mean, the yeah. US was founded to empower only white male landowners. We know that in the beginning, women could not vote. We know there was slavery. We know that black slaves were counted as three fifths of a person, even though they couldn't vote to boost the power of Southern congressional delegations. These are explicit things in the constitution that America was founded on. And yet Charles Murray closes out his book with these words, which I find nothing short of despicable. Quote, the return to an embrace of the American creed must be a celebration of America's original ideal of equality under the law. Fuck you. That's, Fuck that's you. such a lie. Wow. We must reaffirm the American creed explicitly and quickly, or this country will become just another big power like other big powers governed with all the historic oppressions that America tried to cast off, end quote. I got I, nothing, I, man. Any final dude, thoughts from you? <laughs> I mean, it, like, I mean, what I want to do is just like laugh slash cry scream because this kind of, and I'll return to what I keep hammering back at Right, because this is what this is the conservative way the conservatives look at the world in general. But the problem here is that it's it's sort of couched in this uh, slathered with this veneer of intellectual uh, intellectual rigor and academic rigor, and that's what makes it dangerous. That's what makes it disgusting and particularly offensive. Particularly offensive. Um, and this guy is a fucking snowflake. Fuck this guy. Yeah. Well, that about wraps it up for today. If you like our show, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and tell your friends to listen. New episodes post Mondays at noon Eastern on YouTube and all the major podcast channels. We also publish new articles weekly in our journal at theradicalsecular.com. I'm Sean Prophet. Thank you for being here. And remember, wherever you are, you can be radically secular. The Radical Secular Podcast is written and produced by Christoph Defoe, Sean Prophet, and Joe Okipinti. Logo and main title designed by Tim Stetner. Post-production and original theme music by Sean Prophet. Special thanks to our support team, Lindsay Brightman, Jillian Sky Jacobs, and Lori Field Okipinti. Okay.